which is about how our environment um, can um, be taken care of and how sometimes it gets polluted and what its effect is in habitat. A habitat is um, where, where organisms live together. You have to remember we can't live by ourselves. We have to live with other organisms. So, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But why is um, tulip ponds important to organisms? Tyson's Lagoon is an important area to maintain the habitat that have come here for millennium. It provides nutrients, food, and a place to stay protected while they're on their journey from the north to the south, and then the south to the north back. This is a little uh, video um, of the back side or the um, north side of Tule Ponds. So as you can see, we have lots of trees, we have lots of water, and this is a perfect place for animals to live because of its um, be, mainly because of the water and the trees. Um, all organisms need water. And if you notice or you walk around um, sometimes cities, there isn't very many opportunities for animals to um, drink water. So. Seasonal wetlands are great for newborn chicks. They can eat the grass and their mother can protect them easily. This is a Canadian geese and with her four little chicks that are probably about, oh, no more than four days old. So this is old. the breeding season right now at Tule Pond. So we have lots of ducks. We have lots of um, Canada geese uh, hanging around um, with their little babies. They're very territorial, so they make a lot of noise. But this is a, uh, an, a, a refuge. Um, Tule Pond is not open to the public, just so you realize it's not a park that you can walk on. We usually do field trips for students, but because of the um, restrictions, we're not doing those right now. But as soon as the restrictions are open, we will have a few open houses where you can then see some of this um, going on. Now, we're gonna investigate some of the organisms that have been affected over time and what has happened to the habitat than 300 years ago. We have a little storybook, and again, you'll be able to see this storybook online. Now, this Ophician stone, I'd like to show you something just before I start. But as you can see, this looks like a rock, doesn't it? Because it is a rock. And if I open it up, this is what geologists call a concretion. You find these, this one was found in Brazil. Um, there's a whole lot of these that are found like this. And when you open it up very carefully, you start seeing a fish, two fishes. So the two fishes, as you can see here, is when the fish died, got trapped in between sediment, usually during um, what we call a sediment flow or debris flow, they get trapped in between and then they get preserved. And so this is actually, this is a, um, an animal that would have lived in the uh, Bay Area 300 years ago. So let's go back has and think about it has our environment changed in 300 years i have been in that stone for over a million years what a journey to finally come out and tell my story excuse me my name is coho salmon i was fossilized over a million years ago when i got trapped in a mud layer during a large storm i'm looking for my friends chinook and steelhead. We are distant cousins. Our ancestors have been on earth for 40 million years. And about 1 million year ago during the ice age, we were abundant in the cool rivers that flowed from the mountains west into the San Francisco Bay. And actually up to 300 years ago, these species were living here. We all belong to the salmonoids a group of fish that can live in fresh and salt water. This is a difficult task for any vertebrate, an animal that has a backbone, because of how bodies handle fluids and salt. Our body changes when we migrate from fresh water to marine. Some people cannot recognize the changes. 
So there's only a few fish that can do this. They can go from uh, salt water to fresh water, then they have their babies, and then their babies go out to the salt water. And they actually, some of them change dramatically. Like trout here, if you see in the picture, will turn into a steelhead. Um, and they look just differently. And we'll explain that in a minute. A salmonoid body uses chemistry to get rid of salt when it moves to the ocean. They are able to poop it out. This helps to maintain a balance. When the salmonoids return to fresh water, it can easily adjust. So if we lived in salt water, we cannot because our body can't, that's why we can't drink salt water because salt is, will ruin our organs. And so you have to have a special system. So in here, you can see the, um, the water going through the area. So let me just follow it through, it's pooping right now. So water's going in and it has, um, uh, the salts go through the gills, and then the salt is lost through its poop. And then it also has another system where the water goes through um, the, the remaining salt in urine. So this is a very complicated system that only a few fish do. Salmonoids are born in fresh water and live in creeks, rivers, or lakes for about one to three years. They will then go to the ocean and spend another one to eight years before they return to the same stream. Salmonids are anadromous, fish meaning they migrate from salt to fresh water to reproduce or spawn. So that means that they're coming back just to have babies and then they die. And then their babies go back to sea and live there from one to eight years. So it's a very complicated system and you have to have a very nice water system in order for that to happen. If you could imagine 300 years ago, if you went to Alameda Creek, there would be steelhead and salmon coming up the river and the Ohlone's would be um, catching them with their bare hands to eat. So this is a, was a very important fisheries area at one time. In fresh water, salmonids prefer clean, cold running streams with gravel bottoms. Warm water has too many dissolved chemicals and disturbs their life cycle. The body is equipped to get rid of salt, but not other toxins. I just wanted to jump into the creek I was born in for a long time, Coho exclaimed. Coho jumped into the river, but was surprised by the warm temperature and muddy bottom. The river is not flowing like it used to. He could barely swim in this creek. He looked around to find some other salmonid, but instead he saw these unknown creatures swimming. So when he became a fossil, there, it was a different environment. And when he came back, could he survive or would he want to survive? Coho met a native Western pond turtle swimming near him. Coho asked, the, uh, asked about the fish. The turtle replied, in 1873, the California government introduced warm water fish to California streams. Livington Stone, a fisheries expert, transported fish by train from the East and Midwest to the San Francisco <laughs> Bay Area lakes. So by 1873, something happened to our waterways that all the fish, the cold water fish, disappeared because the cold water disappeared. Hmm, wonder why. Why would they do that, Coho wondered, as the population of the San Francisco Bay Area increased in the 1800s. The forests were cut down and humans started to dam rivers for water supply. Streams and lakes suffered because of pollution from, from sawmills, siltation, and log jams, Turtle replied. So it was, and it has to, if you look at the date, 1800s, it was when the gold rush started in 1849. That's when men, most of our problems started. Too many people came looking for gold that they didn't think about the environment. The turtle continued, the waters became warm and local species could not live in the water. The new fish were brought in for human food. They introduced non-native fish, including large and small mouth bass, bluegill, brown bullhead, 
black crappie and sunfish. These introduced fish could survive in warm, slow moving waters that the humans had created. So think about it. If these warm water fish could survive, what happened to the others? Humans kept using the waterways to get rid of their waste. Nitrates from too much fertilizer, phosphates from soap, copper, iron, nickel, lead, zinc, and other heavy metals as human built cities and drove cars. Even sewage from cities were once released into the waterways. And guys, if you don't know what sewage is, that's your poopy. That went into the waterways up until the 1970s. Native and non-native fish were having trouble surviving. So our waterways were just super, super dirty. Humans realized that they were harming the environment. So they developed a system of pipes under the roadways and homes. Some pipes contained sewage were in, were, that is clean before going into the waterways. Other pipes called storm drains are used so rainwater does not flood cities and the water is not clear, clean. Now guys, just so for your, we'll talk again how our sewage is cleaned in a later presentation. But humans thought the native fish would come back after they cleaned the lakes and creeks, but the new habitats were not friendly to native fish. Even the non-native fish are exposed to chemical accidents. So the new fish, that, that were here could only remain. What happened was that all of the other organisms went extinct. All the other fish were, went extinct, the cold water. Oops. Let me go back here. The turtle ended his story by telling Coho of an example that caused several fish killed. Chemical pollutions from the land was carried to the pond by storm water. A plume of a column of toxins surrounding a school of large mouth bass and caused over a thousand fish to die. I'm gonna explain this to you guys a little bit later, um, but here at Tule Ponds, we are actually having a problem for what happened starting in 2013. Almost a third of our fish would died because of human problems. We still do not know what caused the kill, but their bodies were found along the shore. Luckily, they were eaten by scavengers and only the remains of bones and scales were left. Nature can help clean up tragedies caused by pollution. So if anybody recognizes this big bird, if you ever notice this around the Bay Area, um, we, this is a turkey vulture and they will eat things that are dead. Um, usually they only will eat things that are dead. And so they came in here and cleaned up the area within a few weeks but I'll show you some other pictures later on on this tragedy. It was a different world and Coho did not know if he could survive. He started to realize that maybe he should have stayed in the stone. Coho slowly moved back to his stone and lay down to have a place forever in history that would tell the story of a land that once was, but would never be again. Because sometimes when you create a tragedy, you never can go back. Note, this story is about Tule Ponds at Tyson's Lagoon that was polluted from 19 to 1850 to 1997. Now the area is part of a restoration effort. And so that's why we're here at Tule Ponds, our nonprofit, is we're trying to make Tule Ponds a, a refuge for, um, for, for native fish. Now also I wanna show you this one right here. This is one that we, you can find these, if you know where Brentwood is, we do have evidence of uh, fish that, um, were, that were living and then got um, uh, preserved as a fossil. So this is locally um, and we have them um, in another place. So I'm gonna go back to my presentation, just bear with me for a second. So one of the things that we wanna talk about here is um, how does things get polluted? I mean, if you just put, how does nature bring stuff to waterways? Now you have to remember, it's every mountain's dream is to become flat. And there's something at, at work on our planet called gravity that brings everything that high, low to what we call sea level. So er erosion is natural. 
with its wind. So this is um, an area here when it's raining. The storm water will just come down. Storm water brings in water from the surrounding watershed. It could come fast and it could erode the area. Okay, so if we want to live on Earth, I want to make sure we understand this, is that science helps guide our de decisions. So we have to know a lot about our environment in order to fix it sometimes. So let's just do the obvious. Animals need oxygen like us and we breathe off carbon dioxide. Most other um, plant animals, including insects, do that. Plants need carbon dioxide and they give off oxygen. So together, animals and plants live together. Now that didn't always happen on our, as the earth evolved um, because animals evolved, um, uh, they had to wait for enough oxygen to be in the atmosphere. And you have to remember everything, even us are made up of elements and compounds and they are all in the environment. And when they are eroded, they can come into a waterway like Tule Pond. So some of what comes in here is good, but some is not. And that's when we, um, that's what scientists have to do. We have to kind of monitor nature. And that's what we're doing here at Tule Ponds, um, that we have to see if there's any problems. And then luckily humans can help um, engineer. Those are environmental scientists. Um, and different kinds of biologists, geologists. So environmental science is actually a very heavy science in order to correct mistakes that humans might have made. So let's just take a look at what we're going to do in the rest of the presentation here. We're gonna look at chemical and physical pollution. Chemical means heavy metal. So things, if you look at that little diagram on the, um, on the, um, on the side there, on the right hand side, you notice that it says CD, that's short for cadmium, CO is cobalt, CV is copper, FE is iron. And so if you see all of these elements that are in, um, that can cause some problems and where do they come from? Well, gasoline, the little dot, this is a data chart. So gasoline has cadmium, copper, lead, and zinc, exhaust, so this is, this is how things get into our waterways, just by eroding. If you think like making a, a, a road is made out of asphalt, and if you notice down there, asphalt has copper in it, it has nickel, and it has zinc. And as they're eroding from water, it gets into your waterways, and our animals need that water to survive. Now, even our tap water, is we drink the water, it's good for us, it doesn't have bacteria. But if you take tap water, and don't do an experiment, please, and put a fish in it, the fish will die. Because our tap water has a chemical in it called chloramine that prevents oxygen, and a fish needs oxygen. So you need to leave the water out before you put it in your, um, to put fish in there because it needs dissolved oxygen. So even our tap water is great for us, but toxic to fish. Then there's also physical things that we find um, in the waterways, um, like plastics. I know you've heard all about plastics, but plastics um, can be very, um, uh, not only is, are they unsightly, but as they decompose, which takes a long time, they do put other chemicals in it. But a lot of things that come from plastics like styrofoam, they make little bitty, they break up and the little chicks and the little ducklings, they'll all eat them thinking it's food and it'll get into their system and they will die. I have seen that so many times um, over here at Tule Pond. Now sediment also is a problem. Now you probably think, but that's earth. Well, if, if humans, for instance, have made too much of a problem with too much sediment, it can prevent uh, little plants from growing and then the animals have nothing to eat. And, and things physical or even cigarette butts. Now I know you probably think, oh, they're little, but they're not little. The little chicks will then eat them and it will ruin their stomach system. 
So even the littlest pieces of, of physical garbage can cause a major problem. Okay, now let's take a look at the design of tulip ponds. Now, the left-hand side is um, an, a drone view of tulip ponds, just a, a one part of it. Um, and if you look onto the black and white picture, you'll notice a blue line and a red line. Now, those are traces of the Hayward Fault. And if you notice, the big pond, which is called Tyson's Lagoon, is been here for at least 4,000 years. We know that from geological records. That's been here for a long time. So animals have been using this for a long, long time. But if you notice on the other side, it says Pond A, Pond B, Pond C. This in 1997, the Alameda County uh, Flood Control and Water Conservation District of Alameda County, they decided that they were going to do an experiment to see if they can restore the area. Because before this time, there was nothing here except for a very, very polluted lake. A lot of people would use their dirt bikes and just run through it, so no animals would live in here. So the design was to clean the water. Now, if you look back on this picture here between, this is gonna be a video between pond um, C and B. And if you notice in here, it makes a smaller area. There's a bridge to go over. That's so that we can help when, it, when, the, when the summer comes, we can take the trash out, physically remove the trash. So there, there's ways to help design to get trash out of the system. Now, this is when it rains, it brings water that can bring good with the bad. So this is during the rainy seasons. And you can see the rain coming in, and it's, bringing, it's coming along Walnut Avenue, which is near the Bart Station. So any piece of particle that people leave, even their dog poop um, or um, little bag, they all come in this area. And so this is when it rains. But because we live in California, and you're going to see North Carolina is a little bit different than we are, because we, this will dry up. And if we look at it, this is um, an area that was dried up after that rain, and look what it left. Now, this was just one episode, guys. This is not an accumulation over a year. And so you can see the most pollutants we get here are balls, are um, uh, plastic bottles now. Before it used to be the plastic bags. When they stopped doing plastic bags, we've seen a big reduction. We still get a lot of cigarette butts and we still get a different types of plastics. We get a lot of Starbucks uh, cups, believe it or not. So I'd like to tell you a few stories that happened just recently, why scientists have to monitor this place all the time. There is a, um, they're building new apartment houses not too far from here, where there used to be um, just, um, there was uh, corn growing there. And it was a pretty good acre size, probably about um, 10 acres. And so now they started to construct. Now, when you do that, and you, the, and you don't, and you put cement over everything, that water will come out very quickly. So it'll go through the storm drain. And then what happens, sometimes these contractors dump illegally. What does that mean? That means they'll clean off their equipment and dump it in the, into the uh, storm drain. And so a lot of times I would have to monitor it. So if you look at the picture of the water coming in, see how sediment, all that brown stuff is sediment just from the construction site. Now, when that comes in, that's like a lot of things hitting these little organisms and they can't survive. It also makes it so, so uh, dirty that sunlight cannot get through. So a lot of the algae that the bigger organisms depend on uh, can't grow. And so this is not very good. It would take almost a two to four weeks for the water to clean, uh, settle down. Now, this is another um, area here 
where the storm drains, um, somebody released something. That I'm, we're not even sure what it was. It disappeared um, into the lake before we could actually, but we come over here in the morning and sometimes we see a mess. Now, this is the fish kill I was talking to you about. When they started to build a BART extension, this was 2013, it looks like somebody put some gravel on the outside that was, that they used chlorine on it and it, there was a rainstorm. And then one day, simple walking by here and there is telling us what is going on. It smells all over the place. So we went, of course, down there and there was at least a thousand medium-sized fish. These are big mouth, um, big mouth bass, small mouth bass, and sunfish. And they were just all there. And oh, we were so worried about what we were going to do. Like, how were we going to clean all these fish? Because it was really stinky. And then what we realized, that was in the storybook. It talked about the vulture. The vultures would eat it. And on the left-hand side, that is what um, was left, just the scales of the fish. But this was when people do things illegally. So the city did find them, but we didn't, it didn't make the fish come back to life. Now, also, we're having a problem right now. This is in 2018. Um, we have our water district decided to, to move the water that normally comes in here during the, during the summertime, they would just bring it in. Um, uh, we have underground springs here and they diverted it. And we lost so much water. We lost about um, a half of our water. And what happens is this normally, and you'll see a picture of it real soon, about what this looks like today. But that was three feet of water in this area that just dried up. So what happened? So this is it drying up. It just gets smaller and smaller. The plants can survive for a little bit, but what happened to all the fish? And then this is an extreme area where the fish can't survive here. Um, so what happens is the animals that eat the fish, now I mean, you might not have ever seen this before, but we have big pelicans and they would come in droves and the water had gotten so shallow, they just put their big old um, um, uh, mouths in there and this ate almost everything. And so today we are really, we still are um, trying to grow the fish back. It's very difficult. So this is what it looks like today. Um, we're working with the um, Alameda County Water District, I mean, not Water District, well, we, we're trying to walk, work with them, but we're working with Alameda County Flood Control um, to try to get it, but this is what it looks like today. The sun is coming out at Tyson's Lagoon. The tulies are starting to grow tall. You can see them in the background. Um, these later will be cut and so made into a tule house. this is when the environment house. is better. Our fish population and our turtle population went down drastically. So we're looking for grants to kind of make a, a fish nursery here and maybe even bring back our native fish because all the um, non-native fish um, are kind of not here anymore. So what we're going to do now is we're going to um, switch you over to Debbie. And Debbie is from North Carolina and she's going to come up with some ideas for you guys. So when you're walking around or, or you have, um, uh, you want to try to experiment on your own, there's way in which you can see how, how erosion and how some of the things that I talked about can affect the area. And like I said, when we do open up, I wish you'd join us. And if you do have any questions, um, you'll be able to um, uh, come over here and ask us questions. So, Debbie, are you on? I'm on. Yep, can you hear me? Can all the kids hear us? Kids, can you, if you can hear me, wiggle your fingers. Can you hear me? Uh, I don't know if I see any wiggles. Yep, okay, they can hear me. Okay, good. It's on you. Go ahead, Debbie. You want me to put this okay. on? Oh, uh, I was just going to tell you, this is um, a lake where I live in North Carolina. I used to live in Fremont, 
and I go back and forth between North Carolina and California. Um, but if you look at this lake, it's a lot of water. So go ahead, you can play the. I should mention too that Debbie is a wildlife biologist, and so she knows her animals really good. All right, there we go. We're flipped around. So you can see the big part of the lake. This is actually a cove. Leads out to the main part of the Catawba River is just around these corners up there. But if you look at this water, um, it's about 30 feet deep or so out in the middle. And then it gets more shallow. Let me see if I can get you a little closer to the edge here. So, so you can see the water is clear enough that we can see the rocks all the way at the bottom. Why do you think we have these rocks here? Why would we need rocks along the soil? Yeah, to keep, protect it, to keep the edges from falling in. Now, if you look right here, we've got a lot of stuff. All this extra stuff in the rocks, pine needles, piece of trash, even these pieces of wood. Where do you think those came from? Those were actually washed up. The water got so high over the winter, we had so much rain that it actually came up above these rocks. So it's what we call our high water time. And the water level usually here is controlled with the dam, depending on how much rain we get. And if you see over here on the far dock, there's some ducks sitting over there. So again, this is Lake Norman. Lots of water, lots of sediment issues though. Lots of pollution issues, runoff. Okay, so one thing about um, the weather between our two places, North Carolina, we get about 44 inches of rain a year, 44 inches. California, you guys get about 16 inches. So we get a lot more rain. Um, again, this is a river that's been dammed up. We have a couple um, power plants all along the way um, that give us our, our electricity and this is also our drinking water um, is pulled through. Um, so let's go to the next slide. We'll see what we have to do. Hi everybody. I'm back with another fun experiment. We're going to try to make an example or a model of how we can move stormwater. It could be a stream um, or a creek, or it could just be the actual stormwater itself. You can use all kinds of materials. I've run around my house and found a few things that might give you some ideas. Um, one thing simple would just be some aluminum foil. And I've just folded up the edges. So you see how that makes a nice little stream area. Um, you could use something like the plastic trays or even these little boxes like the file plastic boxes. This is a paint for painting, just lines the box. Or you could also even just use the top of a big container. We just need something to be able to put um, our substrates on. So our substrates are going to be sand. I've just got some regular play sand or I've got some potting soil or I also have some kinetic sand. That's the stuff that's a little more gooey kind of stuff. Um, let's see, we've also got some other kinds of toys like Legos or um, Lincoln Logs, kind of wooden pieces that we could maybe add in as part of our structure. We've also got another kind of little Lincoln Log. We've even got like some pretend little animals. Um, since we're talking about stormwater, we also need to remember parts of stormwater, the pollution parts. So papers, plastics, um, we've got a couple different things here that can represent some of our pollution. You could use rocks, sand, glitter, uh, again, different types of rocks, Tr um, the little trucks and all, we could use that as well, Play-Doh even. And I bought this little sponges just because that would represent our wetlands. Because that's one of the most important things that we've noticed at Thule is recreating that wetlands as a way to control the stormwater. All right, let's get busy. Okay, we've got two models set up. Let's see, Megan made hers with the paint liner and she put some sand on the bottom, some potting soil on top and a few rocks. You can see she's added a few animals, some fences. Ooh, fences to hold back the dirt. Mm. Okay, we'll see. Um, this one here, I've got the green sponges to be our wetlands. We've got some soil and then some miscellaneous rocks and we'll see where our water ends up. All right, so Megan, you can choose however you want to pour your water in, how much you want to pour, and how fast you pour it. Can't see. Oh, you oh make it boys and girls, what happened? Oh, 
we've had a little bit of a flood. So you see, we made a trench right through there, moved the fence. And so now our storm water was flowing fast enough, it was strong enough to move all that dirt. So now we would call that sediment. And that's filled in the bottom. All right, let's see what happens on this one. Again, it's up to Megan how much water she wants to pour. Hmm. Our wetlands is doing a real, really good job of soaking up the water. That's the whole point of having Thule Ponds at Tyson's Lagoon. That's the low point for 700 acres. Its job is to grab hold of that water, keep it down into the ground. Go ahead, keep pouring. We'll see if we can get a super saturated. Oh, we've got some coming out into the dirt. Oh, we've got some, you see a little bit of motion. So this is time where you can just play. You can be like a beaver and try to make some dams. You can, it's always fun to try to make the water um, flow the fastest and then try to make it flow the, the um, slowest. You can rearrange your materials and see how it's moving down through there. Okay, <clears throat> so how's that for an example, guys? You think you could do something like that at your house? You can just look around and find anything, the stuff that you've got around your house, ask mom and dad to help. Um, this just gives you an example of how you can play with water. Now, I always like to dig in the dirt and, and make my water try to go as fast as I can get it to go. Um, on these tables, you can control the slope or like the angle. Um, that paint tray already had an angle a bit. Um, and I, was, I had the tables on my backyard too, which is also sloped. Um, so you can play with different angles like that. You can also control how much water you put down. Uh, you could put a timer on to see how long it would take for the erosion to um, happen. And then you can also use your descriptive words. Sometimes it's easier to draw a, pi a picture of what the erosion looks like um, and to put words to it uh, than it is to necessarily have numbers. So there's lots of different ways you can describe your experiment. Okay, but hopefully you can play with that. But that is fun, something fun, how to try to make the water move fast or to try to make the water move slow. Try to make the mo water move um, straight line and then try to make it zigzag or slow down. Okay, Joyce, we'll go to the next slide. All right, everybody, here's another thing to try. I've got a lot of different colors of sprinkles and all here different kinds of sands, rocks, papers. Remember when you did your scavenger hunt through the stormwater, through your neighborhood, um, all the things that you found, leaves, sticks, plastic, paper, um, anything like that you could put in as your examples. It doesn't matter what you've got. You can try all different things. Um, we're just gonna put a few of these to represent the pollutants that come off of the roads and off of the cars as they drive around. When it rains again, then all those pollutants are gonna be washed off of the roads. Um, a lot of times we don't think about these, but these are many of the heavy metals. And at Thule Ponds, in the man-made side, Pond A is where these heavy metals are um, supposed to be dropped out into the water, where the water goes a little bit slower. So Megan's putting in, we've got all kinds of different colors going on there. Let's put some on this side as well. Again, we're going to put them right next to the road because that's where those pollutants would be. And these are everything like um, motor oil and grease, antifreeze, brake linings, rubber from the tires, exhaust, gasoline, um, engine wear, asphalt or concrete. And again, all these would be those heavy metals. There's a lesson um, on the website that you can also go to for more examples and more information on this. All right, let's see what happens. Again, it's up to you how much water you pour out and how much with what speed you want the water to flow, how you want to control it. Sometimes having these other things gives you an idea of how how you want to change your oh, designs. You guys making your guesses what's going to happen? Oh. On this side too. So again, you can spend hours playing with this. And again, you can use anything that you've got around your house, give you different examples. You'll see, remember the first time I had sponges in there to represent our wetlands and taking those sponges out and you see those heavy pollutants, those heavy metals are spreading out quite a bit. All right, so this gives you an idea of a few things to do. Again, you can go to the website for more information. There's several lessons there that you can follow up on. Again, those lesson plans are designed 
to be read by teachers or parents, and then you guys help along with your kids. So I hope you guys have fun experimenting with storm water. See you next week. All right, guys, I gave you a couple different colors there. Oh, hold it just there for a second if you can. I gave you a couple different colors to use for the pollutants. Um, but remember Dr. Bluford talked about how we had physical and chemical. Uh, if, you, if this was real life tulipons, uh, we wouldn't normally be able to see some of these pollutants. Um, some of them would just dissolve and they would be, still be a pollutant in the water, but it's not necessarily gonna be something that you can see, okay? Um, but this just gives you a good example of how the colors mix in so that we, we have them enough that we can see. So then you can trace them as you make your um, experiment, see where it goes. Okay, let's go ahead and go next. For another thing you can do, I want you to just look around your own house and your own neighborhood and see if you can find any signs of storm water that are around you. Wanted to remind you, this little toy that I have, I've got a red car, yellow car on the bottom, and when I drop the car down, even though the path is zigzagged or crooked, the car still ends up at the bottom, and that's because of gravity. So even with water, oh, say hello to blue, and pickles in the back. <laughs> Okay, I'll talk over them. But this car is a lot like like the water. It's always going to seek the lowest spot. So when you're around your neighborhood, I want you to look at your yard, your own yard and your own house and see if you're uphill or downhill. Here in my backyard, I'm downhill. So if I were to bounce a ball and let it roll down, it would keep rolling and it would eventually end up in the lake. If I was in my front yard, it would roll down and into a storm drain, okay? So just pay attention to where you are what's around your environment and look for um, the storm drains and all kinds of different ideas of storm water management. And I'll have some pictures for you to look at too. Okay, have fun with your scavenger hunt. Okay, so this is something that a lot of people don't think about. Um, when it rains out there, where's that water gonna go? The only place it can go, since you guys have so much concrete, everything's paved over, it has to go in the storm drains. Now, when you go and you brush your teeth, or you go to the bathroom, that water is going to a treatment center. That's going somewhere different, okay? So we've got two different kinds of water. So let's go look at some of the pictures that I found. These are some of the storm drains and things that I found in my area. Um, this is a big, see this big metal tube? So that used to carry the water. Um, it's so old and rusted and fallen apart. You can see there's a big tree that's fallen over it. So all the sand has been carried into it. Um, and you see the creek is over on the far left side. Um, there's still some water running, but the creek has rearranged since it's gotten all clogged. See, this is the other end of the tube. See how it's, all the water has pushed and clogged the other end. So the storm, uh, the uh, water had to find a new place to go. So again, that gravity is what's gonna draw that water down. All right, and you see even in this picture on the right, we do still have some trash. Look up there, and then there's sand on top of the sediment or on top of the debris. So it's just layers upon layers. Does that look like a fit place that fish could live? No. Nah. Okay, go ahead, switch. Let's see. Oh, here's that big old pipe. Again, the trees, look at how the steep that bank is. If you look back over to the right, see how much greenery we have. Um, we have to be careful when we go out in the woods too, because we've got a lot of, um, we've got copperhead snakes that are poisonous. We've got um, a lot more, I don't know, the yellow jackets and all that too. Um, so it's just a little more effort to be able to study water here. If you look at the right side, look at where all that mud has settled out. We've got this red mud here. And when the water is moving fast, it carries, it picks up parts of that mud. So that's why our mud puddles are that red color. And that was where the water was moving so fast that it's made this big gully. It's just eroded the, the ground right away. All right, go ahead. Okay, look at the storm drain on the left. What's covering up that storm drain? It's filled up with rocks and all the dirt. So you see up top, there's a little bit of that red mud again. So they had placed this dirt and sand on top of the red mud to be a nice place to walk. But then when it was on, it's on a little bit of a hill. So when the rain came, uh, again, because we get so much rock, so much rain when, um, when it does rain, 
we had so much water that it just was able to push all that sand down. So now it's kind of clogged up that drain. So that's going to be an issue farther down. The engineers are going to have to deal with that. Now look over to the right. We've got two storm drains there together. Um, they look pretty clean. A little bit of trash looks like on one. Probably a piece of paper. Okay, go to the next one. Ah, okay. Look carefully at this storm drain on the left. This is more like the grates that you guys see um, in California. There's a little rose bush up top. What's between the storm drain and the rose bush? Can you guys see? Can you guys tell what that is? A little furry kitty cat? So that's a little wild cat. The first time we came around, when we walked around, um, her little head was just sticking out of the storm drain. So there are a lot of animals that can live down in the storm drains. Uh, they go in there to hide um, and all. So she's just a little one of the wild cats. And we do have the wild cats at Tule Pond as well. And we take care of those, um, make sure they're safe. And then on the right side, these are the signs that we have that go along with a lot of the storm drains that you see where it says, don't pollute. And it says it flows to the waterway. So when the water builds up and it's going into those storm drains, it's going straight out. So the water at Tule Pond, everything comes into there. And if it's overfilling, then it goes all the way out to the bay. It goes all the way out. It doesn't ever get filtered or cleaned first. Okay, that's why storm water is so important. So as you look around your neighborhood, take a little walk and get an idea of the things that you might see. You might find plastic bottles, metal, paper, cups, leaves, sticks, rocks. You could make a list of all the things you find, and then you could also make little tick marks or a graph. You could even make a graph of how many of those items of each thing you found. So that's a way of putting some numbers to your experiment. Okay? Nope, oh, Joyce left me for a minute. <laughs> so there are lots, again, different ways that you can um, try to put numbers and all to your experiment. Let's see, Dr. Blueford. Where did you, you have 12 children oh, that yeah. want to ask questions. Will you answer, will you take those questions? Yeah. Okay, so go ahead, Hagos. She, she's going to unmute. What's Suhela? Okay, do you have a question for Debbie? Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. What? Okay, so oh, there's Anish. Anish, do you have a, a question? Yeah, earlier you said something about asphalt and like when it erodes, it pollutes the water. So, yeah. yes, uh, so that means that humans can indirectly pollute the waters, right? Without even knowing it. <laughs> Well, we, we know it, but we have to, we still have to be careful because we still need a covering for the roads. Um, so we, even if we use concrete, that still has some pollutants and all in it too. So you, those are choices that you have to make. You have to be aware of what pollution and make your good choices. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Next one. Who else? I'll go. Okay, who has a, who has a question? Huh? So, when uh, go ahead. My ashes. Excuse um, me. When when some when some pipes get pollution in them, what mm. do they flow to? Only one ocean or all oceans? <laughs> you want to take that, Debbie? Um, sure. So underneath your city, because that's why that's why I want you guys to go walk around. And when you're walking around, notice if you're uphill or downhill. Try to figure out which way. If you dropped a ball, where would the ball go? Okay, and down, see if you can figure go out. Downhill. Yeah. So once the water there in um, Fremont, it goes out to Mallory Slough. So yes, underneath your city, there's a whole nother city of storm drains. So we've been trying to figure out for years the water, how it's blocked. Um, Remember how Dr. Blueford was talking about the creeks not coming, as much water's coming in? Yeah. And we think that's being diverted somewhere. Um, but we are still having a hard time trying to figure out because there are so many pipes. If you think about all the houses that you have around you, everyone needs sinks 
and drains for their tubs, for their bathrooms, for their um, kitchens, all of those things, all of the restaurants, those are a whole lot of pipes. So it's another crazy world down there. Um, of course, you'd never wanna go down there um, doing your own experiments. If you come to Tule Pond, we have the big um, culvert, so you can actually stick your head in and yell as loud as you want to, and it's so big, a, a pipe, that you get an echo, and that's a lot of fun to do. Um, but yeah, there's a whole, the uh, planning departments and physical works, they usually are the ones that have to take care of these, and sometimes they do get clogged, and that's when you have to get crews out there to fix them, so they'll have to block off the roads um, while they fix it. Good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Some places, uh, let me add to that. Um, in North Carolina, where I am, we're not as crowded. We don't have as much concrete and as, as many buildings. We have a lot more open space. So instead of a water going through the treatments, we use a lot of well water. So the water comes straight out from the ground. Um, so again, you have to be careful and have that water tested to make sure it's safe. And then also, instead of water being going through the um, from the bathrooms and all going into a chemical system, it's just going into a holding tank in your yard. And a lot of times when it's storm, the storms come, uh, those overflow. So then we get all the bathroom stuff into our creeks. That's crazy. What year is this? Why is that happening? That's just nuts. It drives me nuts. Um, I think we, they also sometimes think we have too much room. Like, so it's, we don't have to worry about it, you know, cause you don't see the pollution, but oh geez, it's everywhere. Um, but yeah, you just have to be aware. Okay. And other things too, is you can look at your water bills. Do you guys have any idea how much, how many gallons of water it takes when you take a shower or when you brush your teeth? You know, do you have any idea? Ask your mom or dad how much your water bill is and how many gallons of water you use because your water out there is expensive. My water is a lot cheaper. Um, okay. All right. Go ahead, Joyce. Huh? Megan? Did you say Megan? Okay. Who has the next? Huh? I can't understand. Megan Juicy? Who has a question? She's not answering. Anybody else have a question? Because otherwise, then we'll, we'll go and I'll show you some other activities you can do. Mega Jyoti, Mega Jyoti can ask. You can talk. My, my name is not Naga Jyoti. My name is Saisha. OK. Oh. <laughs> um, wait, wait, um, wait, where does the, um, the red oh, shit. Where does the red clay come from? It's just in my ground. Like as if here, when you dig, you automatically get red clay and you dig further, you get more red clay. And we have a lot of soil. California, you guys don't have much soil. That's one of another experiment that we're doing is we're creating compost um, to grow some more trees and all in. A lot of your soil was eroded away, it washed away. Um, so we're trying to fix some of those problems too in another experiment. And, and the red soil comes from too much iron in the soils. A, a lot of times when you, when you have iron and water, you get like a rust color. And so a lot of that in, tells you that the element in there is probably iron. Mm -hmm. So at the lake, when the water goes down a little bit, we have a little bit of a layer of silt, fine clay on top. And then below that is more, it's almost like a mud. So my kids, when they were your age, they could dig down in that mud and they would make little pots out of the mud. And then if they got really bored, they would take the mud and they'd put it all over them. They'd mark their faces. They'd just get covered in mud, do it like a mud bath. Um, but they'd always have a lot of fun playing with that. But it's squishy mud. Um, and it's, your cars get stuck in it. Um, Dr. Blueford lost a shoe in the mud <laughs> one time. Um, so again, different parts. Now we do still have areas that have sand. When you go more towards the coast, towards our outer banks, that area gets very sandy, okay? And then when you go up towards the mountains, again, that area is gonna get a little more rocky, but right here where I'm called, I'm in the Piedmont area. Um, again, it's because we get so much water, that 44 inches of water, that makes a big difference, okay? So the red mud's weird looking, huh? <laughs> I'll have to do something on red mud. Yeah, and making bricks. If you ever notice, bricks are what color, guys? Reddish. There's a reason for that. 
Okay, so shall we had enough? Um, guys, I'm gonna go into um, our website Let's see to make sure I gotta do shoot. Ah and okay, I'm lost. Go ahead, talk, Debbie. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so hopefully you guys can try some of those experiments. Oh, I got it. Um, and if you don't want to make a mess, you know, around your house or something, just the next time it rains out there, um, find a safe place in a parking lot and see if you can change the way the water is flowing. I used to work a lot at horse barns, and that was always tried, fun to try to change the way the water was flowing. Keep the pastures from getting muddy so I wouldn't get stuck in the red mud. Okay, almost there. Okay, do you see that? Yep. Okay. So guys, on our website, we do have, if you want to learn more about fish, we do have a, um, um, and this is, and I'm going to show you this in, in, a, in a minute, we have some direct links now. But if you want to learn more about the fresh fish, this is a flash kind of game, so you'd need a computer and not on a cell phone. But this goes through what is a fish, so you can tell the difference between the different types of fishes. And uh, so we have a, a, a way in which you can learn more about different types of fishes and which ones, um, you know, why they, they live in the water. So it gives you the reason why. Um, it gives you background information about, um, uh, about fish in general. And then we have, so you can get then, this is just a, a game that you can find out the parts of a fish <laughs> and you can just put them in like that then also here you there's other ways of figuring out your parts of a fish that it helps you to describe then that that was the bones and then this is the the inside of a fish and this this is kind of important because they are vertebrates you got to remember they are backbones and uh, they're very important, but we don't think about them as living organisms for some reason because we don't see them all the time. And so this goes through the uh, ecology of the area. Like for instance, we have tules. Tules is where a lot of the fish grow more because there's lots of um, um, small little fish live in the tules and then the bigger fish eat them. I should have also mentioned too, the reason why we have a lot of tules here is tules help take out heavy metals. We mentioned that in one of our other presentations, but just so you understand, it's important to kind of understand how the little organisms, so like say the sediment came in, it would have ate the, it would have made those little animals die just from hitting them. And then when you get into the crayfish and then the crayfish are eaten by the, <coughs> the fish, the bigger fish. And so now we have very few big fish. I haven't seen a big fish in I don't know how long. And that really disturbs me. Um, so <laughs> remember I brought in the word native fish. And so this goes through the fisheries, uh, how they got here or what we have. And then we have a little game here. <laughs> These are the fish that are here now. And you can see, you can, t you can tell the name by the, the different shapes. And so you can, so this is what's here in uh, Fremont right now in, in most of our lakes. Um, and then it, it uh, these are in, in some other ones. And these are not from this area at all. And I know one of the things um, we found out that in California, in the 1960s, in 1860s, there were 67 species. Now, 40 of them are endangered. That's a lot. So our fish population in California is really stressed. Although we still have our lakes um, and we have our rivers, we've dammed up a lot for human consumption. So a lot of the native fish just cannot survive, just like here. Now, these are the native fish in, in California. And so this is the same. Um, so if you want to find out what what is here, well, what was here 30 years ago, then you can play this game. Um, we also wanted to do. I had uh, some of my high school kids decide, like, why? Where are the fish from? Where are they native? And so this is another little game in which you can find that all of our our fish that we have 
come from this area here. So how did they come over here? Could a fish walk? Can it drive a car? How did it get here? And that goes back to the little story where it, it talks about um, how did it get here? It's over the 1860s. Could it get a bus? No. Could it take a plane? No. Definitely can't walk. But could it take a train ride? And that answer is yes. So what happened in that 1873 when everybody was eating our fish? Can you imagine San Francisco Bay had fish, outside fish areas where we exported all these fish to everywhere? And um, where Redwood City is and up into San Francisco, there was floating docks where all it was was getting the fish from our salmon and our uh, steelhead. And so everybody, we were eating up our fish. And so that's when the U.S. government got the fish from here, got them on a bus, for an, uh, not a bus, on the train, brought them over here, and then they dumped them into our lakes, and that's how they got there. So our fish had came here originally by the train. So guys, if you are interested in finding more of this stuff, um, I just want, this is our homepage, which is, um, msnucleus.org and as you can see here it says field trips online and then go here to activities and lesson plans and I'm populating this I'm not finished yet but if you want an easy way to get the storybook if you want the the game I just showed you you go into here and then we're going to put all of our videos over here and any of our activities so if you were here last week and you wanted to do the monarch wheel all you have to do is click on the monarch wheel and it'll bring a, a black uh, paper pencil where you can print out and do that activity. So as we continue doing these, we have five more, and um, those five more, if you wanna know which five those are, you would go on this link, which it says online. So next week will be ant trails and other insects here at Tule Ponds. Um, we're gonna do the compost composting. We're gonna do frogs giving water a second chance. That's where we're gonna learn about where our sewage water, how that gets clean. And then we will do the earthquake, the last one, and we'll look about how um, our earth was created in this area to give us Tule Ponds, which hopefully by July, we'll have some open days where you'll be able to come over and take a walk and, and look at the place and remember. So guys, I think we are um, finished for the day. Thank you very much. and. Um, uh, if, again, if you have any questions now, you can just type them in to um, contact us at field at msnucleus.org, and we can help you out. So thank you for joining, and Debbie, thank you for helping out from North Carolina and Hobbes for uh, mon monitoring you guys. So okay. thank you. Bye, Bye everybody.